You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Abood, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. I am uh, happy to have you here and, and glad to and, and excited to talk some, some shoulder. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Cody. Thanks for having me. No problem. And what we typically do is at the beginning, we kind of asked our guests um, a couple of questions is getting to know them a little bit better. And so one of the questions that I have is, you know, sometimes we have a lot of residents that listen to this and are trying to decide what field they want to go into and what made you choose kind of shoulder and elbow as a specialty. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> um, I think that it's a combination of um, some personal experiences that I had. So ironically enough, I had a shoulder stability issue as a teenager. Uh, and I was kind of a knucklehead. And so I kind of ignored it and I dislocated like, I don't know, 25 times. Wow. And then um, sort of liked orthopedics as a med student and decided on that pretty late in the game in my third year. And then I was open to everything uh, as a resident. And then I uh, had the, um, the experience of uh, working in um, the lab for a year with a uh, uh, Dr. Soslowski, who's an expert in the world of, of tendon disease and rotator cuff. So then I started learning a lot about the rotator cuff and tendons. Uh, and then my shoulder still was a problem. And so um, at that point, decided to have my shoulders treated by my current partner and previous um, uh, fellowship mentor, Dr. Jerry Williams, who's the academy president. And sort of one thing led to another. I became more and more interested in the shoulder, knew more and more about it. Um, and then um, we had a good shoulder experience at Penn, but I felt that at the time when I was graduating around, you know, thinking about fellowship or not fellowship, back then, I think people were still probably 30% of the time not doing a fellowship, 70% of the time doing a fellowship. And I was trying to decide between being a generalist and being a, a specialist. And I said, well, you know, if there's one area I, I think is still very challenging is, is really properly diagnosing and treating the shoulder. And so I thought to myself, I could use some extra uh, sort of tutelage for an extra year. Uh, and so I applied for a fellowship in shoulder elbow. Um, and as they say, the rest is history kind of uh, <laughs> matched uh, in shoulder elbow and um, thought I could still maintain some semblance of a general practice with shoulder elbow specialty, but as you learn quickly in practice and you become older, um, you get pretty specialized pretty quick. So uh, as my mentor, uh, Jerry Williams, always says, I'm an expert within six inches of uh, the shoulder and the elbow either way. And that's kind of where I kind of is my wheelhouse at this point. And that's how I got interested in it. So it was kind of a roundabout way. It wasn't one of these things where <clears throat> I knew immediately when I started residency and definitely wanted to do shoulder the whole time. I was just trying to understand different specialties and figure out what, what fit well with, with my personality and, uh, and life. What I really like about it is the variety of cases. Um, you know, I, I still get to be able to do large cases like fractures and replacements. I get to do smaller cases like uh, arthroscopic uh, surgical procedures. So I got a nice mix. Uh, I get to take care of everything. I get to take care of the primary problem and the revision problem. So uh, I like being kind of one-stop shop for, for shoulder problems. I, I don't want to have to refer my problem patients out to somebody else who's more of a specialist. So that's always interesting. And I think um, <laughs> from a work-life balance perspective, um, I think it has a nice work-life balance uh, for people um, as compared to some of the other specialties. Right. And, and to piggyback off that, do you have a favorite case that you like to do uh, the best? You know, you see a couple of these on the board for your OR day and you're like, oh, it's going to be a great day today. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting when I was finishing fellowship, reverse shoulder arthroplasty was just coming out and uh, it was kind of a black box for a little while for a couple of years there. But now it's probably uh, I really enjoy doing uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty cases. Um, I, I enjoy fracture work around the shoulder. Um, I think arthroscopy is very creative. It allows us to kind of uh, visualize things from different angles and, and create solutions, sometimes a little bit on the fly, because even though a tear is a tear, there are different patterns and, and configurations and the tissue quality, so many variables that you have to think about. 
So all those things really appeal to me um, uh, about, um, you know, shoulder cases. Awesome. And, and the last question I have for you is, do you have any, you know, we always, we all love orthopedics, you know, it's a great field, but do you have any interest outside of the field of orthopedic surgery? I really like music. Um, I always nice. say that if I was an orthopedic surgeon, I would have tried to become a world famous DJ. So <laughs> That's I, awesome. I would, have, would have loved to do that and travel the world. Uh, now I'm a little older, so it's not really practical, but that would have been really fun. No, oh, that's, that's, that's cool. That's, that's great. Well, now without further ado, we can kind of go ahead and switch and transition into the topic today. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, massive uh, irreparable rotator cuff tears and some of the different, uh, some of the different treatment options for them. Um, so Dr. Booth say, you know, you have a patient that, you know, comes in, they have a large tear retracted. There's a lot of fatty infiltration, the muscle, you know, it's very, very atrophic. Uh, what are some options for patients that have, you know, these massive irreparable rotator cuff tears? What are some treatment options for these patients? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we, we start kind of with the traditional gold standard, you know, treatment. Uh, first of all, I'm going to make sure they're optimized in rehab because if you can strengthen the deltoid, uh, and do some of the modifications of uh, what was described as a Reading protocol by Steve Copeland and Ofer Levy, you can re-educate the muscles to hopefully help gradually, right? And then you get into, well, those things didn't work at this point. You know, what can you do surgically? And, and um, you know, everything's compared to a attempted partial repair and what we call, a, you know, smooth and move or tuberoplasty and biceps tenodesis. And, and people always say, well, if you're going to compare a new procedure to anything, you got to compare it to that because traditionally that has done okay for, for patients uh, because we know that if we try a heroic effort of repairing these tears, uh, these massive tears um, that are on the cusp of irreparable or quite frankly irreparable, uh, a, a huge portion of them as Lisa Gallitz and Ken Yamaguchi from WashU showed us years ago will fail. Now the patients may feel better, they may assess their patient reported outcomes uh, as better, but if you MRI them, they're not going to necessarily be intact. Um, and so then you move into uh, the realm of, of things that have been, uh, you know, that have been described in the past. So in the past, you know, tendon transfers have been described by, by various um, uh, surgeons, uh, including doing lat transfer. Uh, by Christian Gerber, and more recently, lower trap transfer for patients with uh, posterior superior cuff, cuff tears. Uh, and then you have these bridging operations where you can get the tendinose only so far and you use uh, you know, some sort of allograft tissue to bridge the gap. And then you have uh, the more recent uh, description of the superior capsular reconstruction, which is basically bridging the uh, tissue from the uh, glenoid to the greater tuberosity and sort of providing a um, prevention to superior humeral migration, somewhat fixing the position of the, the humeral head, so to speak, uh, to improve mechanics of the shoulder. And you get into, in certain patients, depending on their age appropriateness, dysfunction, pain, uh, and overall quality of life, you talk, start talking about the use of uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And then about seven years ago in the United States, since about 2010 in, in Europe, this balloon came out, which is basically a synthetic spacer, kind of looks like a ravioli to me a little bit. Um, <laughs> and you put it between the ball uh, and the acromion, and it acts as somewhat of a head depressor, um, which I think... In, in some instances, what the, what, the way I describe it to patients is it's a rehab accelerator because it gives you mechanical advantage to the other muscles that remain to re-educate them, retention them, and help them rehab uh, to, to a compensated um, chronic tear pattern. So we have these patients with acute tears that are decompensated and have what we call pseudoparalysis. But you also have these patients that have chronic tears that are pretty well compensated and you can't really tell unless you get an imaging study. So we're trying to get them to that stage and how you get into that stage is arguable, whether it's a partial repair, SCR, bridging with allograft, tendon transfer, balloon, et cetera. So no, if you fine. look at, 
you know, this is this is the kind of patera that you would look at arthroscopically. And you know, the x-ray, the preoperative x-ray, you can see proximal humeral migration on the left, uh, impingement of, of the greater tuberosity against the acromion. And on the right, uh, you can see uh, from a lateral portal uh, viewing arthroscopically, the uh, rotator cuff, I don't know if you can see my pointer moving. Yeah, yeah the I can see it. rotator cuff uh, is right at the glenoid margin. Uh, anterior is over here, posterior is here. Uh, you can see the tuberosity here. It's got some uh, basically femoralization. And so this is a rotator cuff that, you know, won't typically come over that easily. You're going to have uh, you know, muscle weakness limitation with, with, uh, with arm elevation. And you have both. A, when you ask a patient, what's your problem? They'll say both pain and function. Right. Um, and so, as I was saying, you know, complete repair, again, it kind of is, is generally, if, it, if these are truly irreparable, it's, it's, it may be repairable, but it's not healable. And even if it's healable, it's not functional. So you got three stages to go through. You got to be able to, to fix, heal, and function. And those are three big steps. And I always tell patients, you know, there are three problems in the process. I can do a bad job. And I think no one likes to admit that, but sure, the surgeon can sometimes be the problem. The patient can have bad biology, so they don't heal the tissue despite you putting it where it's supposed to be and giving it the best biomechanical advantage. And then the tissue may not function. So even if you get it to heal, there's loss of elasticity, loss of muscle mass, uh, loss of dynamic activity. Um, and then, or the patient may accelerate rehab so fast or the physical therapist accelerates rehab so fast that they re-injure it. Um, and that's kind of what's prompted some of these, these options. And so, you know, I think if you think about it, nothing is really the gold standard of, of say, you should do this every single time. I, I think a partial repair is uh, considered the gold standard in the sense that it's been considered the most, um, I would say the least risk uh, to the patient with potential benefit. But yeah. I mean, I think the whole goal of all the technological advancements is to have multiple tools in our belt. And, and so I think that if you go back to, to Mahata's work, he, he, you know, he's, he really started this um, thinking of outside the box because, you know, he took a, took a piece of tissue, uh, you know, in his patients, this was autographed, allograft is hard to come by uh, in uh, Japan and did these SCRs with these thick uh, graphs, six to eight millimeters. And, What's interesting to me, and not necessarily in Mahatasburg, but some other work that's been shown uh, in the United States, is that if people that have capsular reconstruction fail the glenoid side, meaning it pulls off the glenoid side, but it stays attached to the, to the greater tuberosity, they seem to still report a, a, a good outcome. And so um, whether it's a balloon or a graft, or, or what some people are now calling a biological tuberoplasty, putting something on, on the tuberosity, putting something between this tuberosity and this acromion seems to give patients benefit as long as it kind of stays around that area. And, and, and maybe, you know, that's the whole secret of why some SCRs work and some don't, or why the balloon may be beneficial in some patients. Right. And it's all about kind of depressing the humeral head. You know, that's one and of the creating big a things buffer there for, yeah. For coupling. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so his results have, have, have been uh, really uh, fantastic. And, um, you know, in, in the United States, uh, it's been done using allograft. And now people are, are using thicker graphs and, and sometimes doubling it up. Uh, there's even a, a technique described uh, by Bonner and Griffin where they basically take a graft and just suture it to the tuberosity. So place anchors in the tuberosity and place it just on the tuberosity. So it, again, it's like a bumper uh, on the tuberosity. Um, and, you know, Steve Burkhardt, uh, who recently retired and a giant in arthroscopic surgery, one of the godfathers of arthroscopic uh, surgery, you know, looked at his, his results and, and he really, uh, you know, in, in his, in his uh, patient cohort, he, he says that as he got better at selecting the right patients for it, his results improved and his uh, outcomes um, uh, improved as well. So you can see his failure rate, not too bad at 14% for, for someone doing an SCR. 
uh, J.P. Warner at Harvard um, found that there is a, a, a reasonably steep learning curve with this. And, and I would say that anyone who does an SCR or has tried an SCR, and I know, uh, Cody, you're going to sports. I'm sure you've yes, sir. watched some. It's not, it's not a technically easy operation. I mean, there's a lot of suture management involved. Um, there's a lot of planning that has to go into this between measuring the graft, placing it properly, um, <clears throat> preparing the, the bone and the glenoid and humeral side. Uh, and then you also have to be careful that the, the patient has the bone quality uh, that's such that will hold graft, particularly on the glenoid side uh, in a reasonable fashion. So, uh, and I think that people that are fairly facile at it can do it in about maybe an hour and a half, but I, I think it still can sometimes take over two hours to complete this operation. And so, you know, there's the time and, and then there's the, the, the cost associated with using multiple implants and grafts, et cetera. Right. Uh, in the OR. So do you have any, any pearls, I guess you could say for, um, for having a successful outcome with, you know, with these superior capsule reconstructions? Well, um, I've, 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 I've not been a fan of doing them. So I can tell you that what my colleagues say about what they've noticed <laughs> is um, it's very important that you repair whatever tissue is repairable. So if the infraspinatus is repairable and then taking that graft and suturing it to the glenoid and the humerus, but also taking the posterior portion of the graft and incorporating it into the infraspinatus. So it's contiguous with the native, native cuff. Uh, and I also think that, you know, thickening of the graft has made a difference. So uh, the thicker the dermal graft is, uh, I think, again, it might be providing some sort of static buffering between the humerus and the acromion. Um, uh, you know, quite frankly, Cody, I, 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 I <clears throat> when I was dabbling with this, I, I didn't have the patience for, for the, the length of how long this operation <laughs> took. Uh, and the, and at the end of the day, um, in some ways, it was still fairly variable whether they did well or not uh, and didn't have too much to do with how I felt about the case after I walked out of the OR. Right. Um, I, I did adopt um, a bit the lower trapezius transfer, which makes a little bit more sense to me in the sense that it's uh, somewhat more of a dynamic stabilizer and in phase muscle. But again, I think the indications for that are fairly narrow for me. Um, especially for patients with, with uh, weakness with external rotation, um, more so than anything else. And, and again, I, I think that it's uh, for, from the perspective of a surgery, that one's a, a bit more straightforward and simple to execute. But I think anytime you say to a patient, I'm going to perform a tendon transfer, it's a little bit intimidating uh, for the patient to hear that, especially since they hear that you're going to be harvesting um, their tendon from uh, their scapular spine and, and transferring that over. Uh, I think it's a little intimidating to them. Right. So, so in that case, you know, we talked a little bit about SCR. Is there any role for, I guess, what is the role for the balloon arthroplasty? Right. So I, I think they, I think if you, if you look at it fundamentally, they kind of o overlap basically. I mean, if you look at yeah. uh, traditionally in, on this slide, uh, the, the, if, if you look at the Hamada classification, you want to have patients that don't have too much arthritis. They have some proximal humeral migration, like you can see stage one or two, but uh, anyone who's uh, into a stage beyond stage three is, is not a candidate as they get arthritic, because uh, I think it's, it's a good stabilizer uh, if there's some dynamic um, proximal migration, but if it's static proximal migration, or they developed some progressive arthritic change, uh, it hasn't necessarily been borne that it, out that it would necessarily benefit the patient. And in addition, you know, this balloon, uh, when it was introduced in the United States, was introduced as a randomized FDA trial. And that randomization required that the patients did not have significant arthritis. So, no, no significant stage three or stage four uh, outer bridge changes uh, on the humerus or glenoid, no bipolar lesions. Uh, they could elevate their arm to 90 degrees at least, so they could not be uh, pseudoparalytic with their arm. Um, so those were all important portions of the indications for this being successful. I think it's similar for an SCR. 
I think if you try to do it in patients with arthritis or patients that can't lift their arm past waist level, you're probably wasting your time and their time, more importantly, their time and, 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 um, and insurance dollars. Okay. And, and so in, in what case, or, or, you know, if you have an example case, you know, when, when would you say, okay, well, let's use, you know, this balloon arthroplasty, this is an option I'm going to go with. And then a little bit more, what is, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, what the balloon arthroplasty is, but I guess, what is it? What is it, you know, the materials that it's made of and, you know, what, what is actually this balloon that, that we're yeah. uh, telling so patients about? This is the actual um, device right here. So on the top right here, you can see the device. It's, it's, it's the beauty of it is it's simplicity. So, um, you know, it's made out of essentially the same material that you use for, for vicral suture. And so that balloon that's translucent there, that's when you're doing the procedure, that's before you inflate it with the saline here, it's rolled up on itself. And I'll show you the video of that. But before, once you fill it up with saline, it becomes this shape here. It looks like a small, um, I guess, pillow or ravioli, whatever you want to say. But <laughs> that's what it looks like. Um, but it's all absorbable material. So over one year, it gets completely resorbed. And we have in the study, MRIs done it six weeks in one year to show that at one year, the balloon was gone. There was no remnant of the balloon. I've even had second look arthroscopies in, in patients and there's no remnant of the balloon left. It, it, so, um, so this is the device itself. It comes in different sizes, depending on the size of the basically humeral head slash subacromial space for a patient. Okay. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I'm really uh, excited about is the fact that I was one of the participants in this um, prospective randomized single blinded uh, FDA trial that went on for approximately four and a half years. Uh, and, you know, the interesting thing about this is I first saw this technology in, in about 2012 when I was in Europe and I was uh, in Reading, England at a course and uh, the founder of this company and the uh, inventor of this device, Asif Dekel, was there. And he was um, like a true entrepreneur working out of a small little room at the meeting. Uh, he only had a small little booth. Right. And he was showing the device and showing videos of patients that were done in Europe and how they were doing. And I, I felt the device. I looked at the device. I thought it was very simple. Yeah, I thought it was at first a little bit kind of crazy. I was like, wow, right. look at this thing. This is ridiculous. And then I said to myself, well, Europeans always get cool technology, but it'll never make it to the United States. And then lo and behold, uh, about three years later, I get um, <clears throat> a call from one of our senior uh, research directors saying, you know, we have um, a company coming in called Orthospace that wants to talk to the shoulder surgeons about being involved in the FDA trial that they're doing. So I went and met with them and, and yes, it was, it was Asif and his team and they put together a pretty robust study. This was about a $10 million study wow. that they put together for the FDA and, and talked about the various inclusion and exclusion criteria involved. And back then um, we were one of the first sites to, to get up and running as far as getting IRB approval and <clears throat> getting everything together. And what I found to be fascinating is when I would see patients with massive tears that had a lot of atrophy that I said to them, look, you have a very challenging problem. And then I would talk to them about their options. I would say, you can do nothing. You can try a her heroic repair. We can consider some sort of uh, augmentation with tissue or tendon graft. And then I would say to them, there's this thing, it's a balloon arthroplasty. We put it in there. Uh, that's all we do. We don't repair anything. So in the, in the study, if you were randomized to the balloon, you received just the balloon. You could not repair any of the rotator cuff. Um, you could do a biceps tenodesis if you wanted to. Uh, you could smooth out the acromion if you wanted to, but you could not do anything to the rotator cuff. So you had to have an intact subscap, an intact teres minor, an irreparable superior cuff, uh, no significant arthritis, 
Um, and you could do whatever you wanted to the biceps. But yeah. it was even the, despite that rigorous criteria, when I would say to patients, I think you might be a candidate for this. And they would hear that I will implant a balloon and stop. And that'll be it. They were very excited because they had heard the stories, I'm sure, from friends and, and colleagues of what a rotator cuff <laughs> so repair so is really like. Right. It's pretty painful. Uh, a lot of people say it's even more painful than a shoulder replacement. Um, not sure exactly all the reasons why that is, but um, and and the fact that uh, some of these bigger tears have a poor track record of healing, patients were very excited to uh, sign up for the study and um, were optimistic that they'd be randomized into the balloon group. So imagine this, I took a patient to the OR, they would not know if they were going to get a repair or a balloon. Oh. Um, and then these patients would wake up and I'm sure someone would figure it out based on the pain level they were having because putting the balloon in creates, I think some stretch pain, but there's no significant violation of bone, right? So if you don't do a biceps TVs, especially you don't place any anchors in the tuberosity, uh, there's none of that bone pain. Mm -hmm. and, and so the enrollment was actually for me very quick. And so uh, we ended up enrolling over 20 patients in the study um, out of a total of, I think, uh, over 160 patients total. Yeah. And you can see this is, this is a, this was the first patient I did in the United States. This was a 63 year old man um, who, if you look at his x-rays, you go, not too bad. It looks like a pretty good looking shoulder, not really arthritic. Uh, if you look here at what we call Maloney's line or Shen's line of the shoulder, there's some disruption of the Gothic arch um, by a couple of millimeters, proximal right. migration. Uh, fairly well centered on the axillary view, um, active forward elevation to 90. And he'd had a previous rotator cuff repair three years prior uh, that had uh, on MRI clearly never, never healed because you could see on the images going from left to right uh, on the coronals, the tendons retracted to the glenoid margin, the heads migrated on the sagittals, there's stage four gutalia atrophy of the supra and infraspinatus. Terry's minor appears to be reasonable. Subscapularis um, generally looks pretty good. A little bit of atrophy and a little thickening. And on the axial cuts, again, the tendon of the subscap appears to be intact. Um, the humeral head doesn't show any arthritic changes. So um, really uh, an ideal candidate. And again, not everyone that walks into your office is, is going to be a candidate like this. Right. Uh, so this is a, you know, select group of patients that are candidates for this. And this is the actual procedure. So this is, this is that patient. Uh, this is me looking from the uh, lateral portal. I'm inserting the sheath. Uh, so this thing has a protective sheath around the balloon. So you insert it through that. It's like its own uh, cannula. And then once you have it in there and you've measured the size, you retract the, sh the protective sheath. And here's the balloon rolled up on itself to allow it to fit. And then you inject the saline and you inject, in, inject the amount of saline consistent with the size of the balloon you place. And it's very um, straightforward, small, medium, large. And, and you can see the humeral head below us here. Right. Um, you can see suture from his old repair still present there. I did not tinnitus his biceps. I yeah. know a lot of people are fans of tinnitusing the biceps often. I do it about 20% of the time, which is probably minority. Uh, most people, I think 80% of the time will team these biceps, which I think is just surgeon experience and preference. Right. Um, and you can see the humeral has depressed. You can see through the balloon. So it's kind of interesting to see uh, the humeral head now lower, articulating against the glenoid in a more centered fashion. Um, and then, you know, the um, thought process of these patients nowadays is that within a couple of weeks, we do want to start them in some um, range of motion exercises to um, help re-educate the muscle okay. muscles. So, and this is what it looks like. This is a, a cadaveric uh, illustration, but this is the balloon with radio opaque dye injected in. You can see it's it's dynamic. It moves as the shoulder moves, and that's because as the shoulder moves, the tuberosity goes in different places, and and it, it consistently though protects the tuberosity from being against the acromion. So that's pretty, pretty interesting, I think.
Um, yeah. yeah, I remember the first time I heard about it, I, I thought the I, I thought the the balloon would just you know float away. <laughs> yeah, I thought that it would float away. Yeah, it's it's pretty important, I think, that when you do this procedure, that you you don't really remove much of the um, bursal tissue, particularly uh, bursal tissue that's uh, around the glenoid uh, margin or medial to that, because um, like anything else, if there's a lot of pressure, uh, as you can imagine, as you abduct the arm, there's pressure. If you create a pathway immediately, the balloon can go into the supraspinatus fossa. So that's, right. that's why I think it goes into this sort of um, slightly into the subdeltoid uh, space here. Space, okay. Um, and, and this was my patient at, at two weeks, which really astonished me because, yeah. you know, I think that anyone who does shoulder surgery at two weeks – uh, it's very hard to get them to move their arm much at all, uh, regardless of what procedure you did, whether it's a DCR, chromioplasty, or rotator cuff repair. Um, and you can see his external rotation was and remains limited because it doesn't really improve your external rotation. Right. But his forward um, flexion was, what, 80, 80 beforehand? And, it was about and 90, improved, yeah. And you can see that, that yeah, improved. you know, he, he – uh, yeah, he's, he's he at that range now. So yeah. really, uh, to me, very, very impressive – uh, initial experience. And I was kind of blown away to be honest. And so we've, we've had uh, progressive cadaveric studies now looking at, at this, what the balloon does. Uh, I did a collaborative study uh, at union with uh, Anna Murthy and then um, the folks up at uh, Western Ontario, London um, <clears throat> with George Athwall have done comparisons of, of what the balloon does versus uh, an SCR it seems that they, they, they kind of accomplish, at least at time zero, a similar goal of um, bringing the head down uh, and tensioning the muscle groups around the shoulder more efficiently. So th this was the study, and I won't belabor it in too much detail. I've already talked about it a little bit. But, you know, anytime you do an FDA investigational device study, it, it's a really rigorous study. Uh, you have to realize it's, it's like – the IRS basically living with you throughout the study. I mean, they are, right. uh, they can audit you. Uh, they check your records. They're very particular about any, um, uh, you know, adverse events uh, that may occur, whether related to the device or not. Uh, it could be the patient had, um, you know, uh, upset stomach three weeks later, you have to document it unrelated to medication or anything else. Right. Um, you know, so, and uh, so again, this was multi-center study. You can see uh, the variety of surgeons that were involved with this uh, in the U.S. and Canada. And um, patients had to be over the age of 40. They had to have what was deemed to be uh, a massive rotator cuff tear that was uh, irreparable. And they had had to have failed conservative management for, for four months. Um, workers' comp was was excluded. Uh, they could not be on uh, preoperative opioids, um, and they could not need any repair to their subscap or any. They could not have any labral uh, work or labral surgery. Uh, if they had significant OA, they were excluded. Um, and if the the tear was deemed reparable, they were excluded. So pretty stringent criteria. Um, this, this, um, this device was, was an introduced by a company called Orthospace. Uh, and then uh, midway through the study was, uh, this was purchased by Stryker Orthopedics. Now this is a Stryker yeah. Orthopedics product. Um, and full disclosure, I am a consultant for them. So um, that I think is, is relevant to this discussion. And what, so I, one of the, I guess, questions that a lot of people may have listening to this is what's the cost associated, you know, with one of these, you know, balloon orthoplasty right. devices. So, so the balloon, um, what we, what um, striker, what they call the manufacturer suggested uh, retail price, right. Just kind of like a car, right? right. So the sticker price for a balloon is $6,500. So definitely not cheap. And right. um you know, the variety of reasons for that. Um, and I think that from what I understand, variety of reasons include 
that Stryker believes there will be a separate code that is paid for by insurances for this because this is a unique technology. There's no other technology available out there. Um, my understanding is they paid $220 million for oh, wow. this technology. So they, they laid out a lot of money to buy this yeah. device, which was at the time not FDA approved. Uh, they also um, want to make sure that there is not this balloon mania, meaning people putting balloons in everyone because cost is somewhat prohibitive. And so I think you're going to think twice before putting a balloon in someone, unless you really think it's really their best option. Okay. And I think that will help control some of the quality of the indications uh, here. Um, but, you know, I like anything else. And, you know, if you think about when the reverse came out uh, back in 2005 or 2004, I think it was about $15,000. You know, now, now reverse is probably in the range of $5,500, depending on your institution. So prices do usually come down. Um, and um, But that is a barrier, right? That's a, that's a barrier for, right. for a lot of centers, uh, uh, especially uh, post-COVID in this, in this economy. Right. And then, you know, looking at our results, uh, this will be coming out in JBJS later this year. Um, we had 162 patients. 83 in the in-space uh, arm and 79 in the partial repair. Uh, average age was 66. And uh, we can see here range of motion. Yellow represents the in-space. Uh, and uh, you can look at 24 months. They all saw a significant improvement in their range of motion. Um, statistically significantly more in the in-space group versus the partial repair group. But... Um, Still, I mean, if, if you can not put a bunch of anchors in someone's shoulder and a partial repair and put something that's dissolvable <clears throat> um, and get the same result in, let's say, a procedure that takes 10 minutes versus an hour and, and 30 minutes. Right. Um, you know, economics aside for a second, it, uh, it seems to be a, a, a nice, nice, uh, nice option for a patient. And, um, and so when you have, you know, these patients that have, um, you know, there, there are all these these different options, just like you're saying, you know, you have the, the in space with the balloon and the SCR, the reverse. How do you I guess what's your decision? How do you decide which way you're going to like what route you're going to take? It's just like you said, there, there are a bunch of different options for, um, you know, for treating these massive irreparable rotators. Yeah, and I, I think um, one of the things, Cody, that I say to all my patients is the factors I consider in every patient are unique because of, because of the patient. And they, they include their age, their health, their activity level, the quality of life, their profession, the severity of their problem, the duration of their problem, the treatment they've had, their short-term and long-term goals, and their philosophical approach to things. And when you think about all that, every time you meet with a patient, you gotta think about all that. And then you start to introduce the options and you can, as you form this relationship with this patient, you can start to see, okay, trying a partial repair in this patient makes sense because their muscle quality looks a little bit better than, than some. Uh, they're on the younger side and this acutely happened versus they have a lot of atrophy. They've had this for a while. Um, they still have some function, but they have a fair amount of pain and they're really risk averse. Uh, they're not interested in a large operation like a, like a reverse or maybe even a, a tendon transfer in some, in some scenarios. Um, so for me, um, my, my options are attempted partial repair, balloon, tendon transfer, reverse shoulder. Um, this is kind of, for me at least, um, remove the option of, of a superior capsular extraction. Uh, because in my mind, the amount of work that goes into this, the amount of I think on the other side for the patient, pain, the, the need for opioid medication, the length of rehab, the loss of independence, and then the questionable result at the end doesn't make any sense uh, when you consider that all in one bundle of, of, of care, right? right. Because we're, we are used to looking at, at things sometimes in line, line item, right? So line item cost, the balloon costs potentially more than, than anchors and a, and, a, and a graft. But if you start looking at it as anchors, graft, hour and a half of OR time, 
loss of independence, no driving, use of opioids, dependence on others, loss of autonomy, out of work, rehab uh, cost. And then at the end of all that, you may end up at the same position you are with the with a balloon, which is success or failure. Well, I'd rather know that a little bit faster with less pain, um, both physical and psychological. So that's why for me, it's supplanted the, the, the need for an SCR in my armamentarium. Mm, okay. Okay. No, it makes perfect sense. I was just trying to get a good gauge yeah. on, on your different indications, but no, no, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, again, you know, the various outcome measures we used, uh, looking at the ASCS scores, the improvements in the ASCS scores for these patients uh, and visual analog scores, um, they were uh, in, in many cases very similar, but again, without the added uh, disadvantage of operative time, introduction of anchors, pain, immobilization, et cetera, uh, that you would require. Um, so, you know, I, I feel very comfortable when I tell patients that I think it's a safe device. Um, if I had a massive irreparable tear, I would choose, if I was going to have surgery, I would choose that operation at my current age versus a tendon transfer or some sort of allograft. Uh, and definitely not for me at uh, this age, a uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. All right. And you can see the mean deployment time is about four minutes. Um, so it, it is, you know, for surgeons, I think we take a little bit of pride in the complexity of what we do. It, it is extremely simple. I think that and that's also kind of nice. I think that um, there's not this huge learning curve that, you know, you've got to implant 30 devices to understand how to do this. Um, I think that uh, once you've seen one, um, yeah, it's very easy to, to perform. And is there anything out as far as long-term data? I know that was kind of like short to midterm data, but is there any long-term data on, you know, on this comparing this to, you know, other treatment options? Yeah. So the majority of the data is, is midterm. There is no long-term right. data. So I would say the way I explain it to patients is if, if it's successful, then I think you should get somewhere in the range of three to five years, because I do have patients now from the study that I enrolled in 2016 and right. they're about five, six years out. And so, uh, and I think the, the study will, uh, uh, that's going to be published will, will uh, has shown that or shows that. So, however, yes, it's not a permanent solution. And uh, as it falters, what are your options then? Uh, I think, you kind of, it depends on your MRI and you got to do a reset. And where are you at that point? Age, health, activity level, handedness, severity of symptoms, chronicity, you know, goals, et cetera. That resets again for me. And so um, I've had an opportunity to reimplant it a second time in one patient. So he had it, survived for about six and a half years and then oh. opted to have it again, uh, which was interesting. Uh, so I think that's a interesting um, situation. Um, so this, this, this will, this will show you this exact, uh, patient again, this is that same patient. So this is the patient that I reimplanted. You can watch it. This is five years out. Four and a half years from your balloon, correct? Great. Back down. That's pretty good. Good. Out to the side. Back down. Good. Arms at your side. Go feet away. Good. So the interesting thing about him, remember, he was the first balloon I ever implanted. Right. And then he also became the first balloon I ever re-implanted. This is him now, October of 2021. His surgery was December of 2015 on the right shoulder. He had a balloon. He's done well. Recently started having some symptoms again. And let me see you raise the arms up high as you can go. So you can see he's a little bit more uh, deliberate yep. and cautious with it. Out to the side. Get to about 90 of abduction. And so this is his x-ray now. Maybe a, a little osteophyte here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, but not a significant change in his proximal humeral migration. This is axillary view. And not, not a, the, the patient that I would say is markedly arthritic. This is his MRI. Um, coronal cuts. And again, you can see I left his biceps intact and um, humeral head looks a tiny bit arthritic, but not 
not terrible. This is his uh, sagittal cuts. You can see again, he has uh, significant atrophy in supra and infra. Yeah, I see. Carries in subscap, not too bad. Right. Um, if you kind of observe that, I mean, a little bit progression. Um, and then um, there's his axillary cuts. And then this is his scope. This is when I went into his shoulder to reimplant the balloon. And you can see there's, um, I don't think there's really any remnant. Right. Yeah, I don't see anything. Of the balloon. Uh, this is a dry scope. I usually start with a dry scope. Subscap looks pretty reasonable, a little bit synovitic. Biceps is still there. Um, um, so, you know, this is, that, that was pretty. You just had surgery, right? Yep. All right. You got another balloon on the right shoulder for the second time, right? Yep. No nerve block, right? Just uh, just the anesthesia, right? Yeah. How's the pain? Uh, I don't feel nothing. Perfect. All right, bud. So, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a few months out now. He's been down in Florida. He's coming back to see me soon. Um, his recovery this time has not been as quick as the last time. So okay. maybe it's not a option the second time around, but we'll see. Um, but, you know, I, I think for me, this is an exciting new technology. Um, I think shoulders, an amazing field and uh, the amount of innovation that's happened during my, uh, my career between the reverse, uh, you know, changes in, in, in um, the way we uh, preoperatively plan and technology, VR, AR, uh, and, you know, different procedures, uh, advancements in uh, arthroscopic techniques, and now balloon. It's really a, a fun time to be a, a shoulder specialist and, and kind of be able to take care of these patients with all these different problems. Um, so for me, you know, I, I look at, at this table of non-arthroplasty options, uh, and I, I'm looking for something that's a permanent solution. Nothing's a permanent solution as far as SCR, tendon transfers, partial repair, or balloon can be converted to a, a reverse easily. Well, an SCR can, but there are some studies that show now that if you have an SCR first, your result from a reverse is not as good. Okay. Tendon transfer, not quite as easy uh, in my experience. Partial repair, yes. And balloon, yes. It's relatively easy to convert. Easy to implant, well, I think an SCR can be a little bit challenging. Tendon transfer, a little bit more straightforward. Partial repair, probably the easiest. And then balloon, is, is easy to implant and then easy to remove. Well, the balloon disappears, so it's easy to remove. Right. SCR is relatively easy to remove. I mean, there is some suture and, and there's going to be some tendinous uh, uh, tissue or, or dermal tissue in the subacromial space. So that's kind of the, the reasoning behind my choice at this point. And so I, that's why, you know, um, you know, <laughs> I think you have to spend a lot of time making sure that um, your first go around with the patient, uh, you do make the right choice because it's a lot of work. And then to find out you chose wrong is, is a little bit um, you know, disappointing. Right. So, so hopefully well, that awesome. you know, covers a lot of this. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions you have, Cody, about it. One question I have, I know you just said, so you just re you've had one patient, we had to reimplant a balloon. Have you had to do any conversion um, to, you know, reverses or any other procedures. And so I had, I had one patient in, in the balloon group that within six months uh, was not doing well and uh, moved forward to the reverse. He okay. was just not, he was just, he was in rehab, just not getting the pain relief and the motion back that we had hoped for. Um, and uh, he opted to have a reverse done. And what's your typical post-op protocol? I know you say you start them off with rehab a little bit earlier. Is that two weeks after? Or when do you actually start them off with rehab? And so, what yeah, do you have them do? Um, right now, uh, I typically have them for about two weeks in a sling. Um, and the thought process there is to just let things settle down, tension, uh, develop kind of a nice little uh, nook for that, um, that balloon in there. And then uh, start them in rehab, get them out of the sling, uh, and have them uh, do both uh, passive range of motion, active range of motion for about four weeks. And then at six, six weeks or so, implement some strengthening exercises. Awesome. Well, Dr. Boot, I think this was a, you know, a great talk. We talked about um, herbal rotator cuff tears. We talked about some of the different treatment options. 
um, the indications, and we definitely t- talked a good amount in depth about the balloon and the indications to use the balloon, how to do it, which is, you know, relatively uh, simple per se, and kind of some of the results uh, regarding it. Anything else that you don't want the uh, listeners, you know, listening or the viewers watching on YouTube to uh, know I, I about? I think it's Im- Im- important to recognize the fact that all these treatments uh, have a have a role but you have to have the right indication. You have to use them judiciously, um, you know, and you have to have good discussions on expectations and outcomes of your patients, uh, risk benefit ratios. So I, I think, again, it's an exciting time in shoulder surgery. There are a lot of options for treating patients, both non-operatively and operatively, uh, shared decision-making um, and, and respecting the tools and using them when necessary only. Yeah, well, Dr. I think, you know, excellently um said and again thank you again for coming on the podcast and i know we'll, we'll see you very shortly again for a, for another episode where we'll talk a little bit more surgical techniques and um and some ac injuries ac joint injuries so again thanks so much for coming on the podcast and uh, being a guest thank you cody